Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Wrecking Turtle, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, I hope you've had a good week, um, and a safe week. I have, uh, but I've also had a very, very busy week as we uh, shifted over from purely virtual uh, learning in my district to hybrid learning, so kids could come in in cohorts twice a, twice a week, and, uh, you know, we had sort of a geometric uh, problem puzzle in each class to make sure they're six feet apart, uh, but it was safe, it was just super, super busy, very fruitful though in terms of learning. Um, so I'm just getting to uh, the first of my Q&A responses. I put that up like two weeks ago. We're calling it the mid-millennial modern uh, Q&A. And a number of people asked sort of questions around like, what is your favorite fill in the blank? Uh, so I've grouped all of these together into this video, um, and then I'll try to answer, respond to the others in a video either tomorrow or later this weekend. Uh, but let's jump in. So we're gonna just talk about Jack's favorites. Uh, let's see, Steve Donahue asks, what's your favorite science fiction TV show? And he wants to turn this into some binary between uh, Star Trek and uh, Doctor Who. I will say that I narrowly prefer Star Trek, probably Next Generation and then Deep Space Nine over Doctor Who. Uh, that said, the students I've taught, uh, particularly those who were in my physics classes and really enjoyed those, to a person. They always prefer Doctor, Doctor Who. Uh, however, my favorite is Battlestar Galactica, so say we all. And if I was giving a second, I would probably give it to uh, The Prisoner, the great British television show from, I don't remember if it's the 60s or 70s, but I've seen uh, that show. That was a weird, <laughs> I consider that science fiction. That was a weird show. Um, Let's see, uh, Inspiring Words asks, what's your favorite American sitcom? It's The Office, uh, narrowly edging Parks and Rec. Um, and my, I'll throw in a bonus here, my favorite British sitcom was uh, Coupling, um, which if you've, if you've never seen that, I think that show is hysterical. My wife loves that show too. I discovered it watching it really late on a Saturday night uh, when I was like 14. And I remember thinking like as I watched the episode, like I'm gonna get in trouble if my parents walk out and like hear what is going on on this. Uh, because it just seems so like <laughs> so focused on like sexual innuendo and um, I couldn't stop laughing and, and just thought it was hysterical and amazing and years and years later my wife I introduced my wife to it and she thinks it's funny so we rewatch that probably every year um, Hester Dunlop who has fantastic taste in music asks which period of history interests you the most and really it's any period of human history I find humans inherently just interesting and fascinating uh, anecdotes quirks little fit little just little details that I I just I have a digressive and distracted mind and I love those um, so every period is is interesting um, that said I find periods of like great transition where you have sort of you know nobody really knows what's about to happen because you have cultures coming to contact for the first time uh, and, and there seem to be so many possibilities and then there is what actually happens in history, and often it's very tragic and sad. Um, but but those periods are always really interesting, those periods of great transition. We might be in the middle of one of those in 2020 and 2021. You know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, that said, um, her, her follow-up question was really interesting. Um, if you could travel back to it, what non-living object would you take with you and to what purpose? And I have a tendency to always interpret the time travel question as sort of like, my responsibility to the rest of humanity to like fill in some some gaps uh, and so it would be some culture that we, we have some records of but not a huge amount and trying to see probably that civilization or culture at its height um, rather than at its at its nadir um, or after it has been you know uh, completely transformed or changed or you know has disappeared so here, living in the United States, it would probably be something like seeing uh, the Aztec or Inca civilizations before the 15th century, or even the Mayans, uh, or here in Arizona, the Hohokam, who you know dug the irrigation canals that still are used, um, or the ancestral Puebloans of northern Arizona, and it would probably be just be some way of have like camera or something that would allow me to document some of what that civilization was like. Um, just to continue to value like that aspect of human history. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Uh, Seeking Stories asks, what are three of your favorite board games and why? So I'm going to group three different categories. One is sort of like quicker games that reward replayability but also aren't that complex. And two that I want to highlight, one is Seven Wonders, which if you're a fan of ancient history like I am, 
you get one of the original Seven Wonders or in expansion packs like uh, the Colosseum or the Great Wall of China or um, Stonehenge, uh, the Hagia Sophia at Byzantium. And so you're building the wonder and it, requ it has different resources, but you also create a whole civilization with like military forces and marketplaces and palaces and theaters uh, and then science innovations. And so you, you have these and you just score points at the end of the game. But it's very, 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 very fun. Um, the other one is Innovation, which is just a strict card card based game uh, where you get technologies and they the colors stack and they have little icons and each technology gives some power. Uh, but you go up through the ages, so you start with prehistoric, you know, technologies like uh, the wheel or uh, clothing, you know, things like that, and then you move into the Classical age, you get you know mathematics or a calendar or things like that, um, currency, and then eventually you know you get around to getting like gunpowder <laughs> or uh, at you know railroads or a bicycle, or at the end you you have like um, the you know uh, artificial intelligence things like that, and so you you get the different cards that you get are technology and they just give you actions you can take some of which help you some of which hurt your opponents and it's very fun it's very they're both very replayable uh, in terms of more like group dynamic games one that I love is Cyclades which is uh, set in ancient Greece you're on a, an island everybody's on a couple of islands and your goal is to try and build up metropoli on the islands um, there's four different building types if you have one of each you get a metropolis or you can go take somebody's metropolis or you can get philosophers uh, and if you get a certain number of philosophers philosophers you turn them in and get a metropolis um, but the cool part is you do all of these things by bidding every turn to gain the favor of one of the greek gods uh, there's four that are in play and then apollo just gives you like some gold uh, if you're running out of money to bid on um, but the other twist is there's always three mythological creatures from the Greek myths that allow you to do interesting things. So a, uh, a, a, a Gorgon can be put on an island to freeze like the people that are there, or the Minotaur can be put on an island to basically like give it an extra defense for a turn. The Kraken can pop up in the ocean and wipe out ships and then move up to three spaces and again, wipe out the ships. Uh, but the, the best is Pegasus, which basically acts like the airborne so you can take troops from one island and move them to any other island. And the Chimera allows you to draw any mythological creature out of the discard pile um, and use it, and then you reshuffle them. So if you can get Pegasus and then a Chimera and Pegasus gets used again, that's how the game is always won. It's fascinating, it is an absolute delight to play. Cosmic Encounter, though, however, is my single favorite game. Um, and that is a game where there's just very simple mechanics. You have an alien, you are an alien civilization. You have one ability to break some rule. The rules are very simple. You flip over a card that tells you which of your opponents you have to attack. You get to pick one to four ships to send to their system for an attack. You get to invite whoever you want to ally against that person. They get to invite whoever they want to ally against you in defense. You either play orange cards to see the victor wins, or you can play a green card to surrender, in which case you get cards from your opponent's hand for every ship you lose. If you succeed, you get a colony. If you get enough colonies, you win the game. If you succeed with allies, they also get that colony. Uh, These rules are very, very simple, but every alien power breaks one of those simple rules, and there are all sorts of cards that break one of those simple rules. So it's absolute chaos and just a glory to enjoy. Uh, you can also play it with up to eight players. I've played it with 10 though. Um, just kind of making up pieces to go along because it's that fun. Uh, I, I've taught it to students, they love it. Um, here we go, Naughty Vampire God asked just a bunch of questions about favorite authors. So here we go, uh, 20th century poetry. Uh, in the United States, Elizabeth Bishop, Mae Swenson, John Berryman, W.D. Snodgrass. All of those are sort of more like mid-century poets. Um, I really enjoy all of those. Uh, let's see. In terms of like outside of the United States, I would say Anna Akhmatova, a uh, great Russian poetess, is, is probably my single favorite like 20th century poet. Um, Federico Garcia Yorka, I, I really enjoy a number of his works. 
um, Pablo Neruda. Uh, you know, he, he's a great poet. Um, Langston Hughes. Those would probably be the major ones. I've read a number of poems by Jorge Luis Borges, uh, and I don't enjoy those as much as I do his stories or even his nonfiction. Uh, Theodore Rutk, uh, he's another poet I really enjoy from the 20th century. Oh, and Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens is fantastic. Um, favorite science fiction writers. Uh, the Chronicles of Doom by Frank Herbert are probably my single favorite like science fiction saga. Um, Urs Ursula K. Le Guin, love her works. Joan D. Vinge, The Snow Queen, The Summer Queen. Um, she has some great short fiction. Samuel Delaney is always interesting. Frederick Pohl is fantastic. Um, Gateway especially is just a marvelous science fiction book. Um, yeah, those are probably be, like the favorite science fiction authors that like just jumped to mind um, in the forefront. Favorite horror writers. So I, I lean more towards like short fiction with horror writers and then a handful of horror novels that I really love. So Ghost Story by Peter Straub and then Salem's Lot by Stephen King. I'm not a huge Stephen King fan, but I really like Salem's Lot. Um, those two novels and then the short, the horror stories of Robert E. Howard. So he has a lot of sword and sorcery, but he also has some horror stories that are very, very effective. Uh, I also regard a number of fairy tales basically as horror stories. So if you've read Hans Christian Andersen uh, particularly, um, I think a lot of those fairy tales are horror stories. They scare living daylights out of me. Um, A.S. Byatt, uh, her short fiction is very strong. Um, she's got a couple of different volumes and anthology or volumes that I've read stories from that have horror stories in them that are very, very effective. Um, yeah, so those, those are probably my favorite horror writers. Historical fiction. This one's tougher. Uh, I, Sharon K. Penman has written a couple of fairly like strong books set during like medieval England. Um, so people who are interested in that, the, the Sun and Splendor is a great uh, sort of big, thick book going from over the reigns of like Edward the Fourth, the end of Henry the Sixth reign, Edward the Fourth, and then Richard the Third, and you know the end of the Plantagenets. That's a really strong book, but she also has uh, the Welsh trilogy. I really enjoyed the second one, Falls the Shadow, that focused on um, Simon Le Montfort and, you know, sort of the, the earliest parliament and things like that. And then the other one that comes to mind, and this is always with a caution, would be George MacDonald Fraser's uh, Flashman novels, where <clears throat> Flashman is very, very, very bad and evil. Um, like flat out assaults women, uses the N word, totally reprehensible. Fraser is using Flashman to show how twisted and venal and corrupt the entire Victorian world could be. Uh, and, and he, as much as we are like smirking at Flashman's ability to survive, he is a reprobate and coward, and he's very open about that. Uh, but the history in those books is amazingly well detailed and really interesting. Um, I find that like the research and, and like the, the end notes that are in those always have me going off finding like primary sources to read and explore. Um, but again, please, be, <laughs> please explore those, those books before you really go in and, and, and like w w make sure you want to read them. Uh, cause they can be pretty, you know, they, they can, uh, uh, um, elicit a very visceral response, okay? Uh, and then, what you know, have you read Hunter S. Thompson? So I've read The Great Shark Hunt, like Omnibus, and then the Fear and Loathing books, it's like Fear and Loathing 72 on the campaign trail. And I will say this for Thompson, <coughs> he's a heck of a lot more interesting and funny than Norman Mailer uh, about a lot of the same subject matter. I don't always agree with Thompson, but there's some very funny stories in there. So let's see. Totally pretentious. Lukash asks, who are your favorite composers? Uh, Mozart, Alcan, and Ennio Morricone. If you include Peter Gabriel's world music soundtrack to um, The Last Temptation of Christ, Passion, and you regard that as like being a composer because it's a film soundtrack, uh, I would include that as well. But those would be my favorite composers. Favorite plastic artists. So I'm going to just interpret that as sculpture. Uh, I've been able to see uh, the David by Michelangelo like in Florence at the Academia. That was amazing. Um, we also saw the uh, baptistry Donatello did there. That was amazing. 
Uh, the other one would be uh, Rodan or Rodin. Favorite performing artist. So I don't know if anybody's ever, anyone else has ever seen this, but um, Antonio Gades and Carlos, he was the choreographer, but he also dances it. And then Carlos Sara films it. Uh, but they do a, a like a, a film version of uh, Federico Garcia Yorca's Blood Wedding that is astonishing. All of the dancers in that are just amazing. Um, I would add in though Anne Reinking, uh, if you've ever seen All That Jazz. And uh, I believe, I believe the actress, the dancer's name is Vera Ellen. She was in um, White Christmas. So the, the two, you know, the, the four like main characters are Bing Crosby, Danny Kaye, Rosemary Clooney, and I believe the fourth one is Vera Allen. She's an incredible dancer. There's a scene uh, with her and Gene Kelly in Words and Music that might be the single best dance scene from like that period of, you know, musicals, the Hollywood musicals. Um, yeah. However, that said, my favorite actual dancers in real life are my daughters and my wife. We do like family dance parties for the past six, seven months we've been doing those. And they're all much better dancers than I am, but I have a lot of fun dancing with them. Uh, Trip Reads asks, what's your favorite ancient Roman play and why? I have only read one play by Plautus and one play by Terence. I preferred the play by Terence because I didn't really enjoy the play by Plautus. I can't remember what the play by Terence was. I need to read more of Terence because I preferred it to Plautus. Uh, and I do not recommend the tragedies of Seneca at all. <laughs> At all, at all, at all. <laughs> Favorite jazz album? This is hard. So if I, it depends. The one I know that always makes me smile is uh, Miles Ahead. The great collaborations with uh, Gil Evans. Just love the, those songs. Um, that said, Monin by Art Blakey. Uh, it's a Blue Note album. That's that's one I always play like um, when we have like guests over who maybe don't like jazz. And then Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch. Eric Dolphy, it's a very tragic like story, like what happened in his life. Um, and it truly was no fault of his own. Not, he did nothing bad. Uh, he was not, he was a very good person. He was diabetic. And when he went into a diabetic shock, the individuals assumed that because he was black, he was a drug addict uh, and was going through like a drug withdrawal rather than that he was in diabetic shock. And so that's why he died. Um, he, however, was an extraordinary, extraordinary trumpeter, and his album Out to Lunch is avant-garde, yet wildly listenable. So I highly recommend that. If you're into jazz and like want to like sort of push your envelope, try Out to Lunch by Eric Dolphy. Uh, John McPhee. I've never read his work, but thanks to your comment, I looked him up. I'm interested. And he asked a question about, so uh, my great-grandparents, I've mentioned this in a couple of videos, were in the Dutch resistance during World War II. Um, so their experience and, and why were they doing that? My great grandfather was actually in the Dutch military when World War II started, when the Netherlands was invaded by Nazi Germany. And so they sent my grandfather up into the Frieslands in northern, the northern Netherlands to basically hide out on a farm so that he wouldn't be a victim of reprisals. And then they joined the resistance. Um, they were very active in it. Uh, but that said, uh, I never met my great grandfather. He, he, uh, ended up passing away like in his... 50s, I believe, like early 50s. I did know my great grandmother. Um, she lived to be into her 90s, but she would never really want to talk about it. It was one of those like, there were things she had done and things she had seen uh, that she never really wanted to talk about. Um, my grandfather would never really talk about his experiences either. Um, you know, in, in contrast to my grandparents who were from the United States who would talk about their experiences during the Depression, sure, like we knew all about that. Like, and what that was like, but my, my, my Dutch family would never talk about that. Um, uh, a, an anecdote would be that my great grandmother went to a, um, high school, like open house with my father and aunt at one point. And the, you know, they have the world languages section and they had the German one. And there was like a little, you know, some German stuff there. And she saw a picture of Hitler, uh, you know, on one of the things and proceeded to take out her lighter and started on fire. Um, there, I don't know of them being involved in any like honors or anything. However, there is a really interesting picture of like their resistance cell after the war is over. And they, they, you know, um, if you've ever read Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, there's a talk about the picture of like the Order of the Phoenix and they're kind of all there smiling. 
It's kind of like that, except that it's black and white and you have this group of people and, you know, between the ages of like 20 and probably 45 and they have submachine guns and all sorts of the, the armaments they had taken. And you can see like it's different types of armaments that they had been able to steal or capture or take um, as part of their resistance there in the central Netherlands. Um, so I think... I think that was the last question about my favorites. So there we go. There are the favorites. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for asking these great questions. Some of them made me reflect. <laughs> Some of them I bounced off my wife. Uh, and I'll try to respond to the other ones later this weekend. But I hope everybody has a, a great weekend. Thanks.